And we didn't have any problems at all last week. No. I started recording. Now let me try to go back to sharing my screen. I see. Okay, it looks like screen sharing has started. Now I'm coming back to YouTube. Start to do, and I mentioned this already, but there. Here I'm back here. Okay, so um, hope uh, hope we don't have any more dropout here. Okay, now this is. Uh, this is my beautiful graphic representation of the surface of a CD or DVD. And you can imagine this thing spiraling, uh, spinning here and playing whatever is on the disc. And, and then I have taken a Sharpie and completely blacked out a wedge on the surface of the disc. So because this is completely blacked out, is and we have this laser spot. Imagine as this thing spins, it's spinning underneath the laser spot. And then when the laser spot scans over the area that's blacked out, it's not able to read any of that data. So that is a huge burst error. Now it plays the data from the center, it plays the disk from the the spiral here gets played from the center on out to the edge as the disc plays. So if you're playing a music CD, the very first tracks on the CD are right down here near the center. And, and what's amazing is that uh, I could take a music CD, black this out with a Sharpie, put this into a CD player, and the first couple of songs on the disc would play fine, even though there were these huge burst errors on the disc. And it wasn't until we get further out, get to you know, the fourth or fifth track on the music CD where it would stop working. Now, I actually find that to be amazing that you can recover from this much error uh, on the music CD. So it really demonstrates the power of these Reed Solomon codes. And um, they're, uh, they're used uh, frequently uh, in uh, applications uh, on network communications. And the reason why I'm talking about them right here at this point is because the link layer in a um, in a network communication system, the link layer is usually the first layer where you start worrying about error correction uh, in uh, in transmitting the data. And um, when we did uh, our ex experiment with the Arduino, and we were trying to transmit the data by blinking the LEDs, we had not incorporated any type of error correction. And uh, so typically that might be handled uh, in the link layer. So the physical layer is just, would be just the optical link between blinking the LEDs and receiving the blinks on the, uh, on the photoresistor. And then uh, the error correction detection might begin to occur in the link layer, which is just that, imagine as just that piece of software that you're using uh, to set up your, your packets, your packets of bytes that then are then transmitted by the link layer. So uh, it might be beneficial if you uh, haven't looked at it in a while and don't remember, you know, go back. If you go back and you look at um, how the layers are set up, 
you see, remember at the bottom, you have the physical layer, then above that you have the link layer, above that you have the network layer, and you keep going up to more layers until you get to the very top, which is called the application layer. And usually the first place where we start doing error correction uh, on uh, network communications is in the link layer. But you can have error correction of some form on any layer. And if you remember, uh, uh, there is a, uh, a point in the textbook videos where he says exactly that, that you can have error correction and error detection at any layer. And uh, so the link layer is the first place where it appears, where you might find Hamming codes or read Solomon codes. So imagine that what it is, imagine where we have an application, the application might be sending audio or video over the internet. And uh, the data the, in the application is broken up into packets. And the packets might have thousands of, of bytes in them. And then those packets at some point, let's say from the network layer, let's say the packets are generated in the network layer, the packets then move down to the link layer. The link layer takes each packet and divides it into a number of frames. And then the frames are actually transmitted on the link layer. And the, the frames are then sent down to the physical layer one frame at a time. And in our Arduino system, that frame uh, might be just one, uh, one character byte, one ASCII code character is uh, is a frame. So we have our message, which would be a let's say a whole sentence of text. The message consists of characters. Each character is turned into an eight bit byte. Okay, so think of we have a we're sending a text message. The entire sentence might be viewed as a packet. The packet is divided into frames represented by each character in the sentence. And then these frames uh, are transmitted, but there's an error correction or detection code added on to the transmission of the individual characters. So you can, you can think of that as how this might work. You can make it work almost any way you want. How, it's however you design your application to use the network. OK, so we have a sentence that's broken down into individual characters. The bytes for the individual characters have an error detection and correction scheme that's used to take those bytes uh, and code them into zeros and ones. And, those, and then each frame where we originally had an 8-bit character, the frame might now be uh, 15, 16, 20 bits even. It could be that many bits after you've added error correction and detection. Then that frame is passed to the physical layer, which then uses the LED to blink out the codes in the frame. At the receiver, it receives that frame. It then... It, checks the error correction and detection. So even if there is a, an error or two in the transmission of the frame, the receiver can detect that with the error correction and detection code. And then that then, out after it decodes the message and figures out exactly which character was sent, it tends to can take those characters and then reassemble the message and then the receiver you can see the message so that's the kind of process that's going on here and um, if you think about it each application you might be transmitting a word file and the the uh, the packets in that word file are going to have a different size 
than a Word file that you might send in a uh, an MP4, MP3 file. So the layers, the, the packets are defined differently for each application. And as you move down the layer, you might then um, convert, no matter how big the, the original packet is, you might convert it into frames, all of which are the same length, but it, it doesn't have to be that way, but it might be that way. So that way, when the link layer, which is worried about the frames, has frames that are all the same length, and it doesn't care what the original application was. It transmits those frames, does an error correction or, and detection process on those frames, and then uh, at the receiver, after it gets those frames uh, received correctly, that frame information is then passed up to the higher layers. The higher layers then reassemble those frames into your packet, and then those packets then go up to the application layer. Your application layer takes the packets and then reconstructs the, the file uh, that you were originally trying to send on the internet. So uh, the, there's, a, there's a lot that's going on, and um, I can only guess at uh, what, uh, what failed when our video went down a few minutes ago, right? There are so many places where this thing can fail, and, um, and we are going over 11 time zones. I'm 11 time zones away. So it's amazing to me that it actually works at all. Um, back uh, uh, a year ago when Mara was doing her uh, video courses from the University of Florida, and uh, I uh, got on and ran some of the, uh, the network um, uh, utilities on my laptop, I wanted to measure uh, how long it took a packet to transmit between Florida and Kyrgyzstan. And each packet, according to uh, according to the the, uh, the software, which you have on all your laptops, um, each packet was taking a significant fraction of a second to transmit. Some packets took over a second, um, which is uh, related. Remember, I'm asking the question uh, in, the, in the videos that I talked about uh, uh, last week. I asked the question, how many times do you have to try to retransmit the packet before it's transmitted correctly? And um, so what you have is the the packets and the videos were being transmitted out of Gainesville, Florida. Um, and then the packet might take 25 hops on the network before it got to Kyrgyzstan. So it would probably go through Russia somewhere, let's say. And um, so it would take 25 hops from one node to another node in the internet. And in each hop, it's delayed a little bit because it goes into a buffer on the node, uh, and then the and then the packet is retransmitted from that node to the next node, and then from the next node to the next node after that. And let's say that happened maybe 20 times. And um, then you want, uh, and in that process, that packet. Um, uh, is actually in the link layer is actually broken into frames. Each frame is then individually transmitted from node to node in the network. Each network goes through this process of buffering and delays and so on. And then when we when the when the packet finally all the frames finally got from Florida to Kyrgyzstan, uh, my laptop would have to reassemble all the frames into a video packet 
and then it would have to do that with uh, the many hundreds of thousands and millions of packets that were being sent for the video and would have to assemble all that information in the proper time order. Well, that was not happening very well, and which is why she had problems viewing her classes uh, that were being transmitted from University of Florida. And uh, because they had to go over that whole distance, they had to get there error free. They had to get there in, in order so that you could reassemble the message. It, it's almost an impossible task when you think about everything that has to happen correctly. And um, so uh, that's what's happening right now. As I'm trying to talk with you, all of you there, uh, I, that we're, this is going into some Microsoft server somewhere. So as I'm talking here and showing you videos off my screen, all of that information is getting broken down by the Teams application, broken down into packets, and then uh, this then passes on eventually to the network layer. Uh, and the network layer chooses the path to the Microsoft server. And it also chooses the path from the Microsoft server to your computers. OK, so the, the network layer has to do that. Then we're transmitting these packets. The packets will then go down to the link layer. Link layer breaks the packets, let's say, up into many frames. It then has to transmit each one of these frames to the Microsoft server. And, um, and then it gets transmitted from the Microsoft server to your laptops. I mean, the, the, it's, it's amazing that it works at all. And, um, and so it's, it's not surprising that sometimes uh, the system fails and breaks down. On um, my end here, I, uh, I have an optical fiber actually going right to my home. Actually, it enters my home. I'm talking here. Uh, I have a, a table set up in a closet. I'm in the closet because uh, it's the quietest place in my house. You, you can't hear all the other noise generated in my house. You can't hear the dog barking. Of course, everybody's asleep now, but um, and I actually have that cable is entering my house through the wall right underneath the table I'm sitting at. And then that, um, that, uh, micro, that optical signal is turned into pulses for the ethernet that is throughout my house. Those pulses are then set up to the, uh, the cable modem I have up on the second floor of my house. Uh, and then that cable modem is uh, getting all that information, decoding it uh, off of the, uh, the network that has been sending the, the information to my house, and then takes that, puts it on the Ethernet um, and or Wi-Fi, uh, both. And then that information is now coming back down here to the first floor on another cable and then uh, goes from there into my laptop. So all of this has to happen without errors. And um, it's, uh, it's quite astonishing. Now let's see here. So there's this video that I recorded a few days ago and I put it on, on my YouTube channel. So if you go on my YouTube channel, if you haven't seen it, you should see this as my latest video that has been recorded and uh, and put on there. Now let me go back here to my syllabus. Just pull this up here. Okay, now, so here is my uh, updated syllabus that I showed you last time. I, uh, 
I'm, and I'm going to post it again with a few small changes. Uh, I'm saying to consider today to be our officially our first class back. And um, so for today, I want you to look at these three videos that are produced by the textbook author. And, then, and I've added, I've actually just added this a short time ago. This is the link to the latest YouTube video on the Reed Solomon codes that I've been, just been talking about. And uh, then I have a set of videos here for the second class back, which would be Thursday's class, according to our uh, way I have it set up. And then in the process of looking at these videos, I have these questions and I want you to look at these questions and uh, try to answer them. Now, uh, these questions can be answered by looking at the videos. Um, you, you can also look at the textbook. The textbook goes into things in much more detail than in the videos. So the first question is a simple question. You learned about this in algebra. How do you divide two polynomials? So this is pretty easy. And the reason why I asked this question is because the Reed Solomon codes are actually based on polynomials. And uh, uh, so I just asked this simple question about dividing two polynomials. And then I asked a few other simple questions about channels and bit rates and and uh, and so on that you will get the answer to these questions by uh, by reading the uh, the chapter or by looking at those videos. And then I give a short solution to each question that either answers the question directly or it gives you a guide on where you can find the answer. So for this week, when you count the whole week, you, you should look at these three videos and then in addition, these three videos. So I have a total of six of the textbook videos, and I want you to try to answer these questions. Um, and uh, so if you do this for every class and every week, as we go into next week, I have class three, which would be next Tuesday's class, and I have some questions directly related to that, to those two videos, and, uh, and I have four questions, sorry. No, five, five questions. And then this would be next Thursday's class, three more videos, and then more questions. So this is the way I want you to do this. I want you to look at the videos and try to answer the questions. Now, if you keep up with this, okay, then when we get to the end of the course, uh, if you've answered all these questions and know how to answer them, I, um, I will give you a sample final exam and uh, you will have solutions on the sample final exam. You will have solutions that hopefully that you've uh, verified on all these questions. So you'll have a whole slew of questions with solutions. So I give you a take home, a take home final, which means I'll give you a set of questions. You can look at those questions on your own time at home and provide the answers. The questions will almost surely be questions right out of this set of questions uh, or at questions on the take home final that you already have the answers to. So doing the final exam will be uh, absolutely trivial. It will be a no brainer if you've looked at the videos and answered these questions as we go along. Like I, I'm not trying to make it difficult for you. I'm trying to make it uh, easy. You keep up with the course, answer the questions as we go along, and you're set. You'll do OK. So let me come back and show my pretty face. OK, so um, um, that's all I have to say for today. And um, how are you guys? Uh, how are you guys been doing this week? Good evening. Okay, sir. Thank you. What about you? 
Well, I'm uh, I'm I'm still alive. I I got my uh, I ordered a T-shirt, um, um, a political T-shirt. I mm -hmm. I should have brought I should have brought it down to show you. I I, I showed to me. I'll grab it next week. It's down in my house, and I don't want to run to go get it. But it's a, a T-shirt, and it has a picture of Trump on the front. Uh -huh. And then underneath it, it says Village Idiot. Village Idiot? What village does it mean? Idiot. Yeah. Huh? Villa, village, okay. Uh, village Idiot. Like, it, it means that he's from the village? And he's an idiot. What? Yeah. He's uh, the uh, Village Idiot? Idiot. He's the biggest uh, idiot like, in the village. Ah, uh, okay. I got it. I got it. Hmm, very. Yeah. I guess you couldn't get away with that, I guess, in Tajikistan. Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, you had a picture of your president that said that. You'd probably get arrested or okay. something. Okay, on this point, I'll mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, but, uh, you know, fortunately, we can still do that here in the United States. So, um, so yeah, I'll have to show it to you. I have a, so I'm going to walk around when I go to the store with, my Trump village idiot shirt on. So are you? Yeah, so you're a Democrat, yeah? Logically, I, uh, you figured that out. Yeah, I'm. I have <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, even sometimes even Republicans, some of the Republicans don't like Trump. Yeah, I know. Um, and uh, yeah, I he's. Uh, I think he's a dangerous man, and um, and. It's uh, it's scary with him being president. Uh, I I hope uh, he's voted out of office, but he's proof that there are a lot of stupid people. So uh, okay, um, so I don't have anything else to talk about. Anybody have any questions? How's the situation in Orlando? Is it okay? Oh yeah, it's it's fine. It's that we've actually had a lot of rain because there was a uh, a tropical depression that uh, came came nearby. Not it didn't go over Orlando. It was probably about you know 500 miles away, but it was enough to give us a lot of rain. So uh, 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 we had we've been having a lot of rain over the last few days. But other than that, everything's okay. I'm glad to hear it. So, uh, okay, you you guys, um, if you don't have any other questions, um, I will uh, look on uh, look for those videos, both the the authors' videos and the uh, and the YouTube videos that I post, and uh, and then as I, like I said, as I go through stuff and I add new videos or whatever, I will send out um, a, an email message to the entire class just informing you that I've done this. And if you have any questions at any time, send me an email. And I don't know if you were all there right in the beginning. I One more thing, let me mention. I have um, contacted today, I contacted a a uh, fellow by the name of Ben Knoll. He's the founding director of the Florida Inter Interactive Entertainment Ac Academy. It's an academic program that teaches uh, students how to do video gaming. And it's the top ranked gaming program in the United States. So, uh, and it's right here in Orlando. And they're tied very closely with the big gaming company called Electronic Arts. Oh, and and uh, so I'm talking with him uh, because I've been pushing for all of the people at UCA because they're, they're saying, gee, they'd like to have a master's program. And I'm saying, uh, well, the two undergraduate degrees that are needed to do video gaming are 
computer science, obviously, and comms and media. And, um, and the comms and media is needed because um, the designing video games is actually much more complicated than most people realize. The, the, it's more difficult to design the levels in a game than you might imagine. You know, games have multiple levels. And how do you move? How does the story change from one level to the next? And the games have to have a story. So that's also what the comms and media people do, or they do stories. So think of a video game as being a story that you participate in. You're a character in this story. So to put together a good video game, you know, uh, Doom. I've always liked Doom. Uh, and... Uh, you know, Doom has a story, and you go through these levels, and the, the monsters in Doom get more fierce as you go from level to level, and the problems you have to solve in each level change. But hopefully, the things you learn at the, at the beginning levels help you in the more advanced levels, right? That's, how the, that's what makes a good game. And the, the game also has to have a lot of good artwork. It's, uh, you know... Back in the beginning, the games were simple. They didn't need a lot of fancy artwork. But if you think about it, even the very first games like Asteroids and Space Invaders and whatever, I mean, they had to have some level of artwork in them. And uh, usually in those games, uh, when you went from one level to the next, uh, things just moved faster. And maybe you had a a few extra bad guys enter the game, but going from one level to the next wasn't that complicated. It's a lot more complicated today. So you need the comms and media people who do the artwork and the stories and design the levels. And then once you figure that all out, you need the, the computer science people to do whatever programming is needed. And, and today, a lot of the games uh, can be assembled by uh, using these gaming engines. And um, when I was talking with, uh, uh, with Ben Knoll about um, you know, what we might do with our students to help get them prepared for doing gaming, and he strongly suggested students should learn the Unreal and Unity gaming engines, which I don't know, but if anybody is interested in you know, trying to do some gaming as their senior project, uh, that's one thing you know, that you could do. Um, uh, and uh, there are tutorials. You, you can't rely on me to, to tell you how to do it because I don't know how to do it, but it's, you're at that point where you you should, I hope, begin to learn how to do things on your own. And I can tell you, you know, what, how that works. I mean, I'm, I'm learning things all the time that I didn't know before. And so I'll go on and I might look at an online video and I understand first time through, I understand 10% of it. You know, um, and then I go back and I look at it again. And What's interesting is the first time through, I might look at something and it seems completely incomprehensible. And then I go back and I look at it again and I understand a little bit more. And then I go back again and again. So I will have to go back and I might have to do something many, many, many times. But eventually it becomes clear. And that is the way you teach yourself new things. And if you, you need to get good at teaching yourself new things, because you know, many years ago, I went to school and I learned how to do something. And what I learned how to do might be good for 10 or 15 years. Everybody used it for 10 or 15 years. And then it changed. So I, I can give you a long history of the computer languages, you know. First language I learned was basic. Then I learned Fortran. And then other languages 
came and went. There was PL1, which was a really hot language for a while. Uh, then there was Pascal, and 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 so you you go through the computer language of the year. Uh, and today, it seems that um, we're still getting new computer languages all the time, even though people, you know, uh, you know, for doing hardcore serious programming, they mostly seem to still do C, C++. In gaming, I'm told the C sharp is important. And with these gaming engines, Unreal and Unity, with these gaming engines, uh, you can build an entire game in the gaming engine without doing any programming, I am told. But you can also add to the game by doing programming. And um, the uh, so the both uh, Ben Knoll and my son told me that the gaming engines have online tutorials and you know and and uh, but you have to go in and you have to you know look at the tour tutorials and the chances are the tutorials may not complete be completely up to date on the latest version of the software version of the gaming engine. Now Ben Knoll told me that Unreal is a full featured gaming engine the people at the gaming companies use. So many gaming companies use Unreal to make their games. And uh, he said it's full featured and you can download it for free. And they don't ask you to pay anything unless you're developing a game and you've sold like over 100,000 copies of the game. So you can use Unreal for free make games and start a small business before you have to pay anything. And uh, he was saying that many of their students start gaming companies because it's once you learn how to do it, it's very inexpensive to start your own company, which of course makes it perfect uh, for you guys in, in, in Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, wherever you happen to be, you get together with a few friends and you can start a gaming company. And he says this happens all the time, which is what makes it perfect. Now, he said the ideal way to start this in his mind is to get um, get a few students and faculty and whatever to visit his, his FIA as the name of his uh, of his academy. It's uh, uh, F Florida Interactive Entertainment Academy, F-I-E-A. And they actually pronounce it FIA, not FIA. Uh, and uh, so he sa he's saying, look, let's get some people to co come from Central Asia and visit. Maybe even get some students to attend there. They can learn how to do gaming and then they can uh, go back and you can start a business. So that's what he's suggesting. And I know that uh, you know, the, the university would be happy about doing that. So I'm trying to uh, get this started uh, with uh, the people, with the faculty and administration there at UCA, uh, and get them talking with the people at FIA and then um, and maybe we can get uh, a few students attending FIA, just like in the past, in the recent past, we've had people going to Cambridge or Oxford or wherever. Maybe we can get people then going to FIA. Uh, and it's probably a bit easier to set that up because I'm here in Florida and I actually know Ben Knoll, um, which is helpful. But uh, he's interested in establishing these kinds of relationship and partnerships. So uh, uh, I'm hoping we can get something going uh, before you guys graduate. And um, so, if so, if you're interested, um, you know, uh, keep. Uh, you might send an email. Let me know you're interested, 
because we have to uh, to figure out how to do this. Uh, we can get you going to FIA first, then with you guys going to FIA, we can learn how their gaming program, their whole program is set up, you know, their whole system, and then we can try to duplicate it at UCA. So that that's sort of the plan here, and uh, it'll be my uh, my parting gift uh, to uh, to UCA. I'm planning on being around next uh, next year, um, and uh, probably. Uh, you know, because with the, all of this virus thing and whatever, budgets are really tight. So I'll stay around uh, even if the university doesn't have any money to pay me. I'll still stay around and potentially teach courses and do things. So uh, that's my plan at the present time. So uh, and with that, I like I said, I don't have anything else. I want to go to bed. Um, so it's already two o'clock in the morning here uh so it's well past my bedtime i typically go to bed nine or ten o'clock you know i'm an old man i go to bed early so uh any questions guys okay thank you very much sir sure anytime i'll see you all next week bye 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 Thank you. Goodbye.